Is moving up through the weight classes a serious concern and is it that difficult? I'm T Cozy and this is with just 15 defeats. Welcome to With Just 15 Defeats, I'm T Cozy, and if you're a new listener to this show, it's awesome to have you with us. If you're a loyal subscriber, you might be wondering where, I, where I've been, you might be thinking that I was dead, I'm not, I'm back, I just took some time off uh, to spend some good quality time with the family and build my business, two things which everyone should find the time to do. Now, this is the relaunch, the relaunch of T-Cozy Boxing and with just 15 defeats. Now, it's a relaunch because I'm going to try and push this forward, right? So we're going to be on all the social platforms. So try and get involved. It's not my forte, but with you guys, I might be able to push it forward, okay? So first things first. We've got the website, tcozyboxing.com, right? tcozyboxing.com, then all the social platforms were on there. So if you can get onto those sites, share, like, all that good stuff, help me out. Help me out because I need some help on this side of it. Now, the second factor of this launch is that I'm going to be continuing with my previews of the big fights and the reviews, but I'm also going to be interspersing it, if that's the correct word, with a few um, episodes where we really get down and discuss the nuts and bolts of boxing. And that's what today's show. Today's show is the first in the series, and we're going to be talking about weight classes and whether they're an issue, whether the problems, all that sort of stuff. Okay, so... As I say, if you enjoy this video, remember, please click the subscribe button and also leave us a comment because I would love to hear from you. And as soon as you send me those comments, I'm going to be right back at you uh, with a rebuffal. So let's get involved. Let's push this forward. This is T Cozy Boxing. Right. So today's show, weight classes. Right. And I specifically want to be talking about moving up in weight. And there's two things that really annoy me about the whole situation, about boxers moving up the weight classes. Firstly, it's the demand by the fans and the media to pressurise a move up after they've apparently cleaned out the division, right? The second thing is the stick and the lack of chance boxers get when they do move up. When a boxer moves up the division, it's almost always, um, it's almost almost assumed that he has not got a chance, right? So we're going to be kind of focusing on those two, two factors as we progress through this, right? And just to make it clear, on the website TKZ Boxing, I'm also going to be putting up a bit of an article about this. So if you want to read it, get involved. And also, I forgot to mention, I'm going to try and get this made available as a podcast so itunes all that great stuff right so check that out so moving forward right so this year part of the reason for this uh, discussion and debate is that we've seen two notable boxers jump up the weight classes as amir khan and kel brook right and i'll get to their specific attempts later right but both fights i believe were more for the money than anything else. But that's really the story of boxing full stop, right? So if we think about weight classes, there's always been an issue since its, it's, since its inception, right? Um, it's, it's, the nuts and bolts of it are about getting two guys together that are a similar size, right? But before the weight classes, I'm sure it's just a case of the biggest guy giving the smaller guy an absolute beating. So like anything, fighting was all about size and power, although I'm sure there were some exceptions like David and Goliath, (laughs) that sort of myth, right? Um, So 
it's the balance between size and skill, right? And I must admit that I've always kind of wondered, right, since Floyd Mayweather kind of went on that, an ama that amazing run and he was just clear out the division, how big an opponent could he beat? <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Like he he's he's one of the greatest, and how big an opponent could he beat? And that kind of almost kind of goes against what I'm saying in this piece. But but anyway, it's always something that that has kind of um, been on my mind. Now, the first problem, the first problem, right, is the day before weigh-ins, right? And they were introduced to prevent guys from going into fights dehydrated. They dehydrate themselves in order to make the desired weight um, the day before. And this, this allows for rehydration over the course of the following day. But but like anything, there is room for, for abuse. So if, if we remember when Margarito fought Pacquiao, he put on 15 pounds... Um, in the course of that 24 hours, Pac-Man only put on four pounds, right? So this kind of setup is always going to be an issue. Some guys will naturally only be just above their chosen weight and as such be at a disadvantage. Some people are crying out for the day in weigh-ins. Go back to how it was. This is dangerous. This is dangerous because if people come in completely dehydrated, then they go into the fight, they could get serious, serious injuries right my opinion is that the solution is to have two weigh-ins one the day before and one on the day then there's no opportunity to rehydrate there's no way that people will be dehydrating themselves for 48 hours right and the guys will need to be at a comfortable weight prior to the first weigh-in this and this i believe will regularize the division right with people sticking to suitable weight classes we won't see this weight jumping that happens all the time, right? So the second issue that, that, that I have is the financial penalties for not making a weight, right? The problem, the problem here is that the promoters and the organizing bodies want the fights and regardless. So they allow boxers to pay their way out, right? So Mayweather Jr. paid up to $600,000 in fines for not making weight. You see what I'm saying? He, he's one of the greatest, but he got out of he got out of these situations because he could, right? So some people will say, "What's the issue um, with Mayweather? He paid a lot of money. He was only two pounds over." But here's the issue: this specific fight was against Marquez. Marquez was already jumping up two weights himself. Okay, he was jumping up two weights himself, right? So he was going to be the smaller man, and Mayweather did not stick to the weight, okay? So there's people that are taking advantage. We had the same issue with Chavez Jr. Um, when Vera stepped up, initially at a catch weight, and then it was rescheduled for the weight above, etc., etc. Okay? This practice does happen occasionally, and the sceptical amongst us will say that they're not actually accidents, right? So put it this way, the richer guy is always going to be able to beat the honest guy, right? So that's not a good situation to be in, right? The third issue, right, and this might be the most important, is that people just aren't fighting at their realistic weight, okay? The other day, I noticed a video crop up on Facebook or something like that, I can't remember, and it was it, it basically showed the mental and physical torture that a female MMA fighter went through on the lead up to the weigh in, right? Now I was watching the video, it's perfectly clear that she was far too big for whatever division she was trying to make. The website that I saw it on was trying to push it that it was almost a snuff film. A lot of you people probably even seen this right, and they did it to obviously get the views, clickbait. Um but to be fair, they weren't far off. She was just far, far, far too big, right? That cannot be healthy, right? So just keeping with MA for a brief moment, right? I can remember back in the day when UFC just started to kind of um, get going big time, like professionally, not the early days, but when it really got professional and the, the weight classes were kind of uh, set up, 
then over a course of a number of years, we started to see the weigh-ins um, and weight cutting, as we see in boxing, right? And as they tried to push the UFC um, big time, the UFC were importing Asian fighters that had um, had a lot of success in a variety of different sports out in Asia, and they were seen as like massive superstars in the martial art that they competed in. They brought them over, but the problem was is that they weren't weight cutting. So they were coming in at like welterweight or middleweight, and then on the night of the fight, they were still that weight, whereas their opponent had threw on 15 pounds or so. So that were a massive, massive, massive disadvantage, right? So let's just move forward from, that's the nuts and bolts of it, right? Now let's move forward to my original two issues, right? So it's the demand from the fans and the media to pressurize a move, right? We've seen this time and time again, um, trying to get super fights made between two guys perceived to be the best in their division, right? Now this is the difference between two adjacent weight classes. That's fine, right? Last year, okay, last year, people were begging Mayweather to jump in the ring with uh, Triple G, okay? So we're talking about a guy in Mayweather who's never fought heavier than about 150 pounds, right? About one... 150-ish at his biggest, at his biggest, right? And that wasn't in his latest fights, okay? But he started all the way down at about 130, going up at a... And he's going to be going up against, in Triple G, someone who's campaigned his entire career at 160. So he's always been that way, right? And he's got one of the most devastating KOs records of all time, okay? You've got to appreciate that Maybe there's only five foot seven. There's only so far you can go. In my opinion, it was a crazy fight to make. Despite the fact that I said just a few moments ago about how big a guy could Mayweather fight. Now, to answer that question, I think that Mayweather could beat guys in divisions maybe four or five weight classes above. But maybe not the best. Maybe not the best guys in those divisions. But he could give quite a few guys in a lot of weight classes above, just because of superior skill, right? Um, so here's kind of like the dilemma, right? You have to think what is better, okay? Is being the undisputed champion at one weight, it being everyone that turned up, a bit like Vladimir Klitschko, year after year after year, um, and just defended it, defended that strap for 10 years, right? Or is it better to be someone who jumped up in weights and won... Um, straps at different classes. Now, at the moment, we've got people like Adrian Broner um, and uh, Malinaji who have won, weight, won titles at different weight classes. Now, are they greats? Are they ever going to be greats? Probably not. Klitschko, I know he's heavyweight, but he, he, just, he just did that over and over again, despite the fact that people were criticising his opponents. He just kept on, um, kept on doing it. Right? And you know what? I look at Triple G and I see that he might have a similar issue. He's being pressured to move to jump weights. There, there have been talk about this Mayweather fight that I just spoke about. Then they're talking about him fighting people that are much bigger, right? The problem for him specifically, right, is that he's a very lean middleweight. And I think it's his natural weight. He isn't hugely muscular. Um, even though he's got that insane power, right? And he could probably beat the most majority of super middleweights, um, and he could probably make some, beat a lot of guys in the following division, right? But he would be putting himself at a disadvantage, so why bother? If he continues to be knocking everyone out of middleweight, he's going to go down as a great. And when you just need other people to turn up to that division, right? So let's move forward. The second point, right? This is the stick... And the lack of chance people get from moving up, right? So everyone wants to see these these big fights. They always they also want to see guys jump up and give it a go. But every single time someone does, the general thought is that they have no chance. Why is that, right? I don't know. There's one simple reason, right? It's always perceived that the bigger guy um, at the 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 upper weight class 
is natural at the way. He's going to be bigger. He's going to punch hard. He can take harder punches. I personally think that's not right. Okay, I don't think it's true. Yes, there comes a point when that does become true. Um, but in most cases, it's simply not the case. So let's just think about this just little little joke, right? It, if Anthony Joshua punches Amir Khan flush in the face, he's probably going to kill him, right? I think most people could probably agree with that. But we're not talking about size dis- differences that are that extreme. Usually, we're talking about, I don't know, up to a 12-pound swing, right? And this is the big thing. Typically... Right, the actual size of the guys is there's nothing in it. There's nothing in it. I'm talking about size. I'm not talking about weight. Size. So that's height and reach. Right. So next time you're you're watching a fight and you see someone step up, actually take a t- take a, a moment to check out the size, the size differential. Right. And because of that, I just want to go through like a few examples um, of. Of this and of notable guys that have jumped up through the divisions, right? So I'm just gonna, I've just got a few few notes written down here. I'm just gonna show you, I'm just gonna talk you through guys that have jumped up through the divisions, right? The first person I'm gonna talk about is Manny Pacquiao. Now, Manny Pacquiao is about five foot five, he's got a 67 inch reach, right? So, and he made his debut in 95, right? A few years later, okay. And he also only weighed 106 pounds on his debut, right? A couple of years later, he's fighting at flyweight, right? And he's fighting an opponent who is a lot shorter than him, got a much smaller reach, okay? Then another five years later, when he goes in to fight uh, Marquez, right? We've jumped up from 106 to 125 pounds, and now he's fighting someone who's about his height, right? So he's fighting someone about his height and about his um, reach, Okay, now Manny Pacquiao is one of the differences because he went up and he started fighting much, much bigger guys, and this shows you this this differences where the talent becomes so superior, right? So in 05, he was at one two two one hundred and twenty nine pounds, and he fought someone who was five foot eight. Then he was fighting De La Hoya, right? Who was five ten. Margarito five eleven. Um, Floyd Mayweather, who was five for eight, and it, it only when it comes down to this year when he fights Timothy Bradley that he fights someone of his size. So Manny Pacquiao shows that he was just a phenomenal boxer, right? So let's move on to Roy Jones Jr., someone who also jumped up the, the rankings. Now he made his debut in eighty nine. He's five eleven. He's got a um, 74 inch reach, right? 74 inch reach. He weighs 157 pounds on his debut. Now, five years later, five years later, he's fighting 168. So he's jumped up um, to super middleweight. He's fighting an opponent 5'10 with a 72 inch reach in James Tony, right? So some people, that's an even matchup. 97 is fighting Griffin, who's only 5 foot 7 and a 70 inch reach. But this is at light heavyweight. So he's fighting at light heavyweight, but he's actually fighting someone who's smaller. And he's jumped up two weight classes, right? I know the weight classes might have been somewhat different. I'm going to use the current day weight classes, right? We then jump up to 02. He's fighting Kelly. He's fighting someone who is about his height with a smaller reach, right? And it isn't until 2003 when he jumps up to heavyweight, right, which was a crazy thing, but he'd done it. He beat John Ruiz, and John Ruiz was 6'2 and 78-inch reach, right? Again, superior skill and speed paid out in that. Move, move on to De La Hoya, right? De La Hoya, 5'10, 73-inch reach. Now, this is the one that kind of shows how... The, the fact that boxers start generally a lot lighter and they move, they bit, they they grow into their size. So moving up the weight classes isn't as crazy as it sounds. So, De La Hoya, 5'10", 73, okay? Made his debut, 133 pounds. 
couple of years later, he's dropping down. Somehow he's dropping down a weight class and he's fighting someone who's smaller than him, five foot eight. Then he's then he's winning a vacant world title at 133 pounds against someone who's five foot five. So he's five foot five and he's fighting so, and he is five foot ten, right? Then he's jump then he's jumping up the classes. Um, Julio Cesar Chavez, only five foot seven, so he's the bigger guy again. He's moving up again. Whitaker, um, who's only five foot six, he's the bigger guy again. In two thousand, he's fighting Mosley, who's only five foot eight, he's the bigger guy again. And then in two thousand and two, he's fighting Vargas, who's five foot ten. So he was had that superior size to start with, right? We've also got Bernard Hopkins, the alien, right? He's one of my favourite non heavyweight fighters of all time. He's six foot one and he has a reach of seventy five. Okay, he effectively started at middleweight and then went up to light heavyweight. Um and really could have gone all the way up to cruiserweight um because of his size dimensions, right? But he's kind of a one off. Because you can see he always looks almost like soft, but he's in amazing shape. He's really lean, but he's not pumped or ripped, okay? And to get up to Cruiserweight, I think he would have had to put on a, like a lot of muscle mass, right? So just to complete this little bit of a case study, right? We've got Thomas Hearns, right? Some would say the most famous exponent of jumping up the weight classes. He was six foot one and he won a world a world weight title um, from someone who was only five foot eight. So it was a complete um, mismatch in terms of size, which then allowed him to kind of jump up the weight classes, right? So now I just want to kind of um, um, talk about these recent fights, these recent fights that have kind of brought this to kind of my attention and why I really wanted to talk about this, okay? Firstly, we saw Amir Khan um, fight uh, Canelo and he was... He, he he was knocked out. He was totally sparked out. Um, and Canelo, he, he currently holds that light middleweight and, uh, and middleweight titles, I believe, right? This fight was actually for the, the middleweight crown, but it was fought at a catchweight. This is what has, that annoyed me about this fight. It really, really frustrated me, right? Um, Canelo, he won the title against Cotto. He only weighed 153 which is effectively light middleweight. Um, so it's ridiculous that it was a middleweight. Like, I don't know how they can sanction world title fights at catchweight. It just makes a mockery of the the division, the, the the actual titles. We already know that there's so many problems with the amount of belts and different bodies and, and whatever, that to, to fight for a world title and what, in a division that is so prestigious the middleweight title to fight it at a catch weight um at effectively a different weight class is an actual joke right so so the first point is basically that Amir Khan didn't actually jump up two weight classes right that's kind of what people forget Amir Khan did not jump up two weight classes he fought for a belt of two weight classes above but he only jumped up to light middleweight okay so it's a bit of a joke, right? So let's just talk about Amir Khan, right? And how his how his career's gone, uh, and just get a flavour of um, where we are with him. Now he's five foot eight, five foot nine. He's got a reach of seventy one, right? So he's quite a he's quite quite a big lad. He made his debut in oh five. He was fighting someone smaller than him. Um, at fifty, uh, five, who was five foot six. A couple of years later, later, he's actually fought. He's actually dropped down a weight class. Um, he's fighting again someone smaller than him, um, and then he ended up winning the the light the lightweight title. I don't know what one one of the titles against K Katelnik, who again was a smaller guy than him. Um, fought Melanaji, who was a smaller guy than him. Um, then. He fought he, it, then in 2014. He's moving up. He started to move up the weight classes. He's fighting Alexander, um, who is about his size. And then when we move on to the world title fight, right? 
Canelo is only marginally bigger than him. And to be honest, I think they're about the same size. It's like half an inch um, in height in favour of Canelo, but then he has a smaller reach. So they're, they're effectively the same size fighters, okay? Um, you've just got that Canelo has been fighting at light middleweight for a couple of years. Amir Khan's been fighting at welterweight for a few years. So the difference in size for me in this fight was not an issue, right? So it's one division. It's one. It's just one division, right? So I'm just going to go through, like, this is the review of the fight. The review of that fight is simple. Like, Khan's game plan was to stay out of trouble, box clever, score points, win rounds. Okay? Stay out of trouble, box clever, score points, win rounds. And in my opinion, he did this for the first couple of rounds. He did this. Right? He actually looked really good. Okay, and I was thinking, wow, Amir Khan, he might be able to do this, right? He then took a massive punch from Canelo, it cut him. Game changer. This was the game changer. One punch, cut. As soon as he saw that, his game plan went out the window. He became risky. He got sparked out cold in devastating fashion. So in my opinion, I, th I think the blood, more than anything, changed the fight. On another day, it's possible Khan continues to box clever and wins more rounds. Does he win the, mat the fight? I'm not saying he does that. I'm not saying he does that. But I don't think the weight jumping was a deciding factor. I think he just... I think it was the blood, and I think he was he's susceptible to be knocked out, he's been knocked out on multiple occasions, and when this big hand came in, it switched the lights off for Amir Khan, okay? So I don't think, again, I'm gonna repeat, I don't think jumping out the weight classes was an issue in this fight. I don't believe it was. Right, so let's just move on to the second Brit who jumped up in weight class, wait, the weight classes recently, okay? This was Kelbrook, right? And he was sink seeking to prize the middleweight title off of Triple G. Now this, as opposed to the Amir Khan fight, this was legitimate. This was middleweight, okay? Both fighters came in uh, just under the 160 limit. To add a little bit of background to this, right? Triple G has campaigned his entire weight at middleweight. He's been a world title holder since 2010, and I believe he's fought in nearly 20 world title fights. Um, he just hasn't got that notable name on his record. It's a bit unlucky for him that uh, Sergio Martinez or Chavez Jr., these guys haven't fought him or didn't fight him. Um, but to be honest, as I said moments ago, Triple G, he's just clear out of the division and he can keep going. There's still guys that are, that are, that are available for him to fight that he hasn't. And there will be big fights. There will be big fights down the road. And I'm sure there will be some other guys that will move up. And you've, we've got Canelo. We've got Eubank Jr. Saunders. There's a there's there's a two or three other guys that are, that are in the mix that he hasn't fought yet. So there's plenty of massive fights for him. There's plenty of massive fights. And you know what? If we're still saying Triple G's undefeated in three years' time and he's fought all the guys that I've mentioned and more, that's... He's already going to be a Hall of Famer, right? But he will, he could go down as one of the greatest. One of the greatest, right? So, so Kelbrook, right? Kelbrook's his opponent. Um, and again, somewhat similar to Triple G, he campaigned his whole career at Welterweight. Now, we spoke about all these guys, Pacquiao, Jones, De La Hoya, Amir Khan... They kind of moved their way through the weight classes as their careers progressed, okay? And it was because they were obviously a lot lighter in the junior parts of their career, and they filled out. Now, Kelbrook hasn't done that. He started at middleweight, and whilst if you look at the photographs of him when he was younger, a young professional, he was a lot more lean. Now he is like a pumped up. WWE wrestler. He's just exploding. His skin looks like it's about to explode, right? Um, which is 
probably not right, and he probably should have gone up through the rankings, right? Um, and I, I think part of the reason why he stuck around at work weight um, for so long um, was that he's been mandatory for a lot of world titles for a long, long time. I may be wrong about this, but I, I, I got this kind of memory in the back of my head saying that he was like a mandatory, or at least in, in, an eliminator for either Mayweather or Pacquiao's titles about five or six years ago. I, I, something like that. Some some crazy thing like that, right? And the big fights never came because one, Kel Brook is incredibly boring, um, and he's never really had that massive fan base, okay? So I think he stuck around because he's wanted to kind of make a name for himself. He wanted those big, big, big fights with those big, big, big superstars, but they were just never, ever, ever going to fight him, right? And he probably should have started to move up the, the weight classes. Everyone talks about like middle being not a brilliant division to be in. Um, so that could have been why he, he didn't want to do it. So, um, yeah, so, so with Brooke, here's the interesting thing. There was talk before the fight that he was weighing up to 185 pounds. 185. So this is someone that's been campaigning at 147 pounds, right? He was weighing 185 pounds, and he was going to be cutting down to 160. So if he's weighing that sort of weight in his welterweight days... That's insane amount of weight to, to drop, okay? But so it, it wasn't like he needed. It wasn't like he was trying to. He needed to pump himself up. He was already massive. And then when we got to the fight with Triple G, I, my opinion, Brooke looked the bigger man. Like I just said about Triple G, very lean, very very lean on his frame, right? Whereas Brooke pumped up. Very pumped up, right? So it was no doubt in my mind that these two guys coming together, this was middleweight versus middleweight. This wasn't middleweight versus welterweight. <laughs> no way. No way. This was middleweight versus middleweight. Um, but as for the fight, Chipple G proved to be the better man, the better boxer, and had the more hurtful shots. But we already knew that, didn't we? We already knew that. Now, here's where the thing comes in. The stoppage was controversial. That's my opinion. Some people say it was fair. I think it was controversial. Um, when it came to it, Triple G had the initiative and he was firing a lot of shots at Brooke and then his trainer threw in the towel. Now, I'm going to continue this and say and be controversial myself. Uh, and whilst it's plausible that the trainer wanted to save his guy, um, I think... I think they. I think he was almost playing a game, right? And it, it, he may have wanted to save his fighter because of the well-documented fight and injuries between Eubank Jr. right and Nick Blackwell. I actually believe this is my opinion that the trainer didn't have the confidence in his own fighter. He knew he'd lose, right, over the twelve rounds, either getting stopped or whatever. And he just he took he, he basically took the gamble to throw in the towel so that he could be blamed. Because we know the fighters don't want the fights to be stopped. Kill Brook, as soon as the fight was over, he was annoyed. He was like, What are you doing? I was evading shots. He was taking shots, but he was evading some. Um and I think the the, the, the trainer took the decision to have a way out. Okay. Um, many people will tell me that it was the right decision, it's your choice, um, which which side of the fence you want to be on this, pro on this process, but these sort of decisions usually cost trainers their jobs, right? Is that going to be the same case with Kubrick? I, I don't know. So here, here, here's the big, big question, right? Here's the big question after all this, right? Is it a problem jumping up in weight? My opinion is that for the high-profile boxers looking for big fights, I don't think it's an issue um, unless they're quite small, right? So if you have the frame for it, it's fine because a lot of guys, they fight smaller, they build up through their careers, right? But there's only so far you can go with what you've got. Do you know what I mean? As I've said, 
the joke I've had running through this about Mayweather, he's never going to be able to fight a heavyweight because he's just going to, the size differentials are going to be too vast. So as long as the guys are fighting other guys of a similar size, which is the whole point of weight classes, right? And they're going into the fights in a healthy position. There's no problem. Jumping up the weight classes is fine. It is not an issue. It's when people are going into fights not healthy. They're putting their lives at risk. That's where we've got the problem. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I enjoyed um, talking about the uh, the issues and the whole situation around weight classes. Um, we'll be back with some new uh, material in the coming weeks. We're going to be doing a few... Um, prediction previews of the fights coming up at the, this present second when I'm recording this there isn't a great deal of fights in the pipeline but I'm going to start to do some um, some previews I'm going to start to do some more shows like this where we where we where we are discussing the big issues in boxing and fighting and remember if you've liked this please give me a thumbs up Please subscribe to the channel, check out the social media, get involved, help me out. Um, and uh, yeah, check out the new check out the new website, um, tcozyboxing.com. It's great to have you on board. I've been Tcozy and this has been with just 15 defeats. <laughs>